Hi, I'm Jeff Yager. I'm a professor of chemistry, biochemistry, and physics. And I'm Vladimir Mujica. I'm a professor of chemistry and school of molecular sciences. So we're here today, make a short video to go through uh, one or maybe even a couple of the discussion questions out of chapter three in physical chemistry for the life sciences. Specifically, this is edition number two of the textbook. And in chapter three, they're covering phase equilibria. And so a lot of the discussion questions that are meant to conceptually go through things and then lead into some of the exercise questions and project questions that we use in, in class, et cetera. And today specifically, we're gonna look at uh, the discussion question uh, number one in this chapter, which is why does the chemical potential vary with temperature and pressure? And so, um, Vladi, what are your first thoughts here? Well, probably the first thing we want to realize is that uh, the, the chemical potential, it's deeply connected to the free energy. Uh, and the, the main difference is that the chemical potential, it's free, it's an intensive quantity as opposed to but the- But what I like to say right here, if you don't mind, yeah, sure, um, uh, I, I like to point that out as well. In fact, like I like to remind them that, you know, DU is the first law is, is um, you know, work and heat. And, the, and I'll put those to make sure that, but you know, I, I usually just start by writing the combined first second law, which is TDS uh, minus, you know, PDV if it's just, you know, this work. Yeah, we'll, we'll bring the last, work, yeah, yeah, just expansion work. work. And then all I tend to, this is the only thing I tend to remember. And then I always just remember that every other energy term, enthalpy, um, free energy in this case, which is usually G, are all just Legendre transforms. And I always just remember the trick that, you know, for each Legendre transform, in this case, G is defined by not only just U plus PV, which is the same as as H, yeah, mm -hmm. but also minus TS. So it's a double Legendre transform. So I'm gonna flip both of these and flip both signs. That's how I you know, just tend to remember it. So it'll be uh, VDP minus uh, SDT. I'm flipping them around just to keep one with a minus, but I flip both, both of the parameters and both of the signs, right? Um, and so, and this is actually where I often like to remind you that, because usually it's once you get to this point in chemical potential is where they actually start now adding a chemical work term onto this, right? Um, and start getting into, and it, it's always stated that at constant pressure and temperature, you know, the molar um, gives free energy, or, you know, the molar at constant temperature and pressure is the chemical potential of that component, you know, of everything but the, you know, N not equal to I uh, component, right? Like, um, so, so you know, the, the free energy, the molar free energy is, the, you know, is often how we think of the chemical potential. Right, absolutely. And, and that's why I really like this question because what, what I just stated though was at constant pressure and temperature, the, Molar free energy is the chemical potential. And now it's asking you though, but aha, but aren't these chemical potentials temperature and pressure, you know, dependent? You know, don't they vary with it? And of course they do, you yeah. know. And, and you know, well, just to connect with what you just said, the, the chemical potential, you can define it here, but also if you look at your equation, your primary equation, du equal to TDS, minus PDV, so this is for one component only. Right, so then right. we can understand this, that if we add... Well, that's term, why I added uh, you know, right. the sum of, because you can have the I number of components, yeah. right? If yeah. you add it that way, then the chemical potential has a different interpretation. Now the chemical potential is the derivative of the energy with respect to the number of particles of component J, but now you have to keep in that definition S and V and, and I well, and, and this is J. why, let's face it, this is why it usually gets introduced with G because as experimentalists, we're used to what it means to be constant pressure, right. constant temperature. And that's why we often, you know, right. do a lot of the uh, free energy or, or a lot of the chemical potential through the free energy. But like you said, it's harder to think about what does it mean to be constant entropy, constant volume. What is constant right. entropy and volume right. conditions? But you know, yeah. the, ma the mathematics of thermodynamics is so beautiful. And you go from one to the other, 
and and you go from from the energy. So we so well, you go to whichever ones right. make the most sense for what you're working. In. Exactly. Yeah. So you go if you write the equation this way, the one the one you like, TDS minus PDV plus mu dn. Right. Then the the energy is a function of S and V and N. Right. Only intensive quantities. Whereas when you oh, go, oh yeah, only extensive quantities. Yeah, yeah, but only, you can only always then only make only them. You can quantity, right. you can always make them intensive just by making right. them a molar right, quantity. Right, 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 anything right. you can. Whereas G is a function of P and T. Intensive parameters of the. Space. Now these are intensive. Right. I say intensive before, but I meant in extensive. Intensive. Yeah. Yeah. So. So you can go from all these different representations because this is what they are. And they jump to transform from, from one another and just and, get you to the convenient ones for right. the system you're working with. Right, right, right. right. So, so, okay. And then I think we have uh, a couple slides that help us kind of look at this as far as, I love this kind of derivation uh, that you have on the left that gets you in a sense to the Clapeyron um, equation, which, in a sense now is showing us that of course the molar free energy um, you know uh, is you know has a temperature dependence and a pressure dependence in other words if you're not holding them fixed but you're allowing them to vary one at a time independently you can separate those two and look at how the free energy changes with temperature and that goes as minus the entropy or how the free energy changes with pressure and that goes as the volume you right know, of the system and it's also this give you you see because when we talk about phase equilibrium we have to understand that whenever we have this equality that the chemical potential of a component in phase alpha is equal to the chemical potential of the same component on phase beta we have phase equilibrium right whenever the chemical potential alpha larger the chemical potential beta then one we have a driving two, force. We have direction. a driving force, and and then one of the two phases is the the stable one, and the other way around give you the other possibility. So then we have to realize that when we use a PT in the, in this figure we have PT or or TP. You can use either way. Yeah, either way. Yeah. Either way. In fact, so, they often get flipped. Like right. you know, geologists will often put pressure, especially when it becomes the most dynamic variable. We often do things in chemistry in this direction because we're almost always varying temperature a lot more than pressure exactly. for normal, bi especially in biochemistry. So whenever we get a line here, this line, phase equilibrium. If we move to the left, one of the two phases becomes stable. We move to the right, the other phase becomes stable. So we have a way, this uh, Clapeyron Clap equation, it gives us the derivative in this plot. It gives us dp dt. Right. But it is connected to the chemical, to the equality or inequality of the chemical potential because right. we are looking at the derivative. In a sense, what you're looking at on that PT is one of the lines, uh, you know, I'll assume just for uh, si simple sake that, that it's probably the liquid vapor line. It's the most common one to look at, but it could be the liquid. Uh, um, I mean, it could be any other phase line, it, but you're just looking that that entire line is where dg is zero or where it's in equilibrium or where the two chemical potentials exactly. on either side are the same. Exactly. That's a lot of ways of saying the same thing. Right. And But what dictates the slope, dp, dt in this case, is what that Clapeyron sh equation is showing you. It's how the entropy changes with volume. Right, and, and, and this particular equation here is, it has some striking consequences in one of our, the, the most important substances on Earth. Yeah. Water. Well, you would say because it's the number one reason that even though we, we use an example of water, it's, you know, it's the, you know, it's the abnormal one. Almost every other thing has a clapper on slope between the solid and liquid that's, right. that's different from that of water. And right. it's only because liquid is one of the few substances where yeah. the liquid is more dense you know, then it's solid. solid. So, we so see, that actually dV is is the opposite right. sign. So we see that water has for the for the solid liquid line, it yeah. has negative it, slope, whereas most other substances has positive. Yeah. Or positive another slope. way of putting it is the other slope, the the one you've done 
drawn down below, which is to the solid to the gas, and then and then you just finish drawing in the liquid to the gas line, those have to be positive. Because exactly. entropy change has to be positive in that direction. This so, guy is always and positive. And volume has to be positive going from a solid to a gas and has to be positive going from a liquid mm, to a right, gas. Right, from going from the solid to the gas, but the gas or going from the solid to the liquid. This one is the anomalous one for, for water. Right, and, and a few other substances, few other substances. Uh, important ones, silicon, right, right, yeah, right, elemental but, silicon. But for you know. water, the, the life in our planet couldn't exist the way we understand it, because just one example, if this slope were positive, then during winter, oceans and, and lakes, they will freeze from below. Right. So all fish and all yeah, and, and the ice, which has, you know, goes back to, you know, it, it causes that insulating layer on top. And because right. of the huge heat capacity of water, it it, yeah, you know, right. it protects so, even so, deeper. So, so we are protected because ice forms a layer. Yeah. and protects liquid water. You know if the if other this one, slope were negative, it would be exactly the You know the other around. one that a lot of people forget too, that is another large anomalous reason that even if um, you didn't have that effect, you have another anomalous effect of water going on, which is as you increase the pressure, the viscosity of water goes down or its diffusivity goes up. In other words, it becomes more liquid-like at high yeah. pressures up to three kilobars. So, I mean, is, you can go really, really deep in the ocean and you're actually making liquid water more liquid-like. Right. I, well, now, again, ice skaters, they also enjoy it because yeah. the pressure increases right where the blade is. And this is why you create this, this thread as you are skating. Right. Precisely because of the fact that this slope here is negative. Okay, let's get back. I'm going to steal your thing and make yeah, sure yeah. let's, whoop, do we go in the right direction? Let's see. Okay, I think that kind of discussed this one. And I think this really does get at the heart at, you know, the temperature dependence of the chemical potential of the molar free energy. You know, it, you know it's, it's because of these changes in entropy and, you know, or the temperature dependence of entropy and volume that you have a lot of the temperature dependence of of uh, chemical potential under these type of conditions. Um, and, and then you go on to, like you said, like this is intimately related to phase diagrams in general. And so you go on to then take it from what I call the tried and true, you know, real quasi or a real clapper on where it's, it's, it goes DP, DT goes as entropy and volume. And now you've made the substitution of entropy for for enthalpy over temperature. Right, this one, right. delta S equal to delta H. Right, over T. T. And, and that's not always true. That's only true uh, for the phase transition. For the phase transition and at that fixed temperature, mm -hmm. you know, um, right? And then you're making a further, and, and then that's as far as you can take it. You can't really take it to the clausius clapeyron equation for solids and liquids because you can't make the assumption that the phase it's going into is negligible that you know that the density yeah. of you know the, that it the, behaves like an ideal gas. like an ideal gas that only really applies for so, low pressure you know vapor right. systems. So, so we need these two guys. We need to make the assumption that these two in this transition liquid vapor or solid vapor the sublimation, the vapor behaves ideally. Right. And then we can work out be this way because then the volume becomes equal to Rt divided by P. Right. Yeah, in fact, it's almost the opposite for the liquid solid. The more common assumption people will make is that delta V is zero. That, you know, that the, the volume change between the liquid and solid is very negligible, especially when you compare it to anything going to the vapor phase. Those are usually, you know, two, three, four orders of magnitude in volume difference, molar volumes, while, you know, the, the liquid to solid is Rarely, rarely is it more than a factor of 10 or 20 percent, right? Uh, in either direction. Yeah. yeah. We, we are not there yet, but it, it is very interesting that this concept of chemical potential is also the key quantity to describe chemical reactions. Because the driving force in a chemical reaction is something that we will take a look at in the next chapter, 
is precisely defined in terms of the chemical potentials of the reactants and the, re the reagents. Well, and the, that's the why I think they introduced this one first. Uh, the reason a lot of people put phase equilibria in front of chemical equilibria is because they, you know, this gives students a chance to look at some of this thermodynamics under things that they're very hands-on familiar with phase transitions, water, ice, you know, uh, vaporization, boiling, you know, before they move on to things where they don't have near the chemical or biochemical intuition uh, to look at. And so looking at it in these contexts first, I think often helps build some, you know, a boilerplate mathematics, boilerplate understanding before they move it into their uh, right. in the chemistry. And probably it's interesting to mention why potential. Because if you think, I mean, the, the probably the simplest example that we are encountering in our daily life is gravitational potential. Yeah. So we all have this experience that if you climb up to a certain high place, then you know where the energy difference is. Because if you jump from there, you, yeah, you, God forbid, you, yeah. then you realize that it was at a higher potential. <laughs> and then you know what happens if you, if you jump and, and you don't protect yourself from. So it is exactly the same idea. The chemical potential tells you in which direction particles are going to move if you don't have anything else. Just so you are like a big particle in the gravitational potential. Right. It's, it's cillions of particles, but in thermodynamics, it tells you in which direction what? matter is going to flow. Right. Well, and it's such, I think it's also really important to stress here that just like you're doing now, like looking at things from kind of several different perspectives and making analogies or metaphors to other things are so important to really grasp these concepts. You know, a lot of times in electrical circuits, they'll bring it back to the pressure in pipes, you know, what resistance looks like versus voltage. You know, making a lot of those connections, I think is critical for students to really get an in-depth understanding. Yeah. And, and the more metaphors and places they can draw analogies from, the better they'll understand right. it. And I know I, it's helped I, me. I, I, absolutely. And you know, we are going to the point where we're going to discuss electrochemistry. And then once you understand that the free energy gives you a way to define and calculate work, and particularly what you might call useful work, yeah, then you understand the connection between free energy, chemical potential, and work. Because in chemistry, we often forget that work it's but for, for whatever reason, I mean, our students don't have this firm grasp of the concept of work, and it is extremely important to understand how this works. works yeah, work. the, all of chemistry is chemical work, you know, <laughs> in a, to some degree. Okay, I think it's worth pointing out at this point, too, that this, you know, talking about the Clausius, which applies to kind of all, you know, you can always say that um, this goes as the, the entropy um, you know, the change in entropy over the, the change in uh, volume, and then how that relates here uh, to the uh, Clausius equation. Those are things that generally hold across all these phases. And it's only as you start doing things to the vapor phase, and you can make this assumption of ideality to the vapor phase, uh, that, that you can uh, get this more simplified or more or, or often used equation, the Clausius Clapeyron equation. Right. right. And and just one one another comment. And that here. that is question three point four asking right. to discuss that. I mean in this phase diagram, you see this particular point here. This is the triple point. That point, the three phases coexist. And as it turns out, for just one component, you cannot change anything there. I mean, this point is uniquely defined. If you add more than one component, you can have a different triple points or whatever. So, so, so it, again, we have to remember that points on this line, the chemical potential is the same. Points there, the triple point, then the chemical potential of the three phases now are equal. Yeah, and that leads into Gibbs phase rule, and, and things like this going forward. The other one I like to mention is, you know, while, um, you know, this one is unique in that it ends, you know, there's also another unique point besides the triple point, which is, you know, typically the, the T and P of the critical point. And this comes, uh, you know, in play a lot. And one is in simple extensions of it to real gases, the Van der Waals gas applies a scaling based on, 
you know, to a critical value. But, you know, these critical points and using super critical fluids above and below where you can really define a liquid versus a gas and realizing that there's always, you know, a continuous way to go between something that is, you know, gas-like or vapor-like to something that's liquid-like, you know, and some of the interesting properties around critical points like critical obsolescence, uh, that you can get these huge fluctuations. And when you start putting that to molecular fluctuation dissipation theorems, it, it, it helps describe a lot of the really interesting properties of supercritical fluids. Uh -huh. The other one I like to mention, just because it's one that you would say is in modern thermodynamics, you wouldn't think there's much left, left, left to learn about water. But the one I always like to remind people is people studying amorphous ice, uh, a, f a colleague of ours is, is, is heavily involved in this field and has written a lot of the reviews in this area. In fact, he wrote one of the famous science article reviews between low density and high density amorphous ice. One of the prevailing theories is that there's a second critical point between two non-equilibrium liquid phases um, of, of water and that it's it's that liquid water under ambient conditions is super critical with respect to that transition. That, that is why you have these density maxima and other things. So, right. so we're still learning things about well, we are, water and, even and, today. And, and since you are mentioning, you know, thermodynamics is an old subject, but when you go to the nanoscale, that is when you go in scale of the order of one nanometer, then something very surprising happens. That everything that we have been learning about thermodynamics, namely the, the energy and the entropy are additive quantities. So we, we, we get a subsystem A and B, and this is true. When you go to the nanoscale, it is not true anymore. So now you have size effects. So now you have the whole field of size dependent or nano thermodynamics. And a lot a of that, right. And, and I like to point people here to um, Hill's book, uh, Hill's book on uh, thermo um, of small systems. Yeah, thermodynamics of a small system. Of yeah. small systems. Uh, you know, and he goes through the trivial of just adding that you have now surface um, area or, or, or the surface, it, it can be a large part of the overall system. So you have to add that work term into it. You have to add now, not just a PDV, but a surface tension into the area of its surface uh, area uh, term as well. So in other words, adding those surface terms to the overall energies that you're looking at. But also, like you said, looking at these, you know, these non-additive and, and in a sense, quantum effects as you get, you know, as you're not able to statistically, you know, assume large numbers as yeah. Sterling's approximation and, breaks yeah. down. And, and then things know. change dramatically. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, I think we've uh, kind of discussed this and it's led us in several different directions as well. And hopefully students, you'll find this uh, discussion interesting when you're going through uh, some of the thermodynamics of phase behavior. Thank you. Thank you.